So a very warm welcome to everyone joining for this year's Gordon Goodman seminar organized by the Stockholm Environment Institute, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Stockholm University. I'm uh, Åsa Persson. I'm a research director and deputy director of SEI. Who would have thought we'd be here only six months ago in a global health crisis, much of the world still in lockdown and uh, with multiple spillover effects on issues like hunger, poverty, education, and violation of human rights. Effects that together combine to further drive inequalities uh, existing in many parts of the world. And of course, the pandemic is also a major disruption for the global climate agenda, which we know is now entering a critical decade of action. Uh, undoubtedly, Gordon Goodman, a scientific pioneer connecting environment and development, uh, would have had many thoughts and ideas how to deal with these multiple crises. On the upside, though, uh, we have, of course, moved many conversations from the physical, sometimes locked rooms to these virtual and more inclusive rooms. So we're very pleased that we could shift this uh, seminar from a physical event in Stockholm to this virtual event. And we are so excited that many of you uh, were now able to join us. Um, I cannot think of a more interesting speaker for this year's Scott and Goodman seminar than uh, Professor Joyita Gupta, who has worked on climate and equity uh, throughout her long academic career in international environmental law and policy. And recently she also chaired the major uh, sixth global environment outlook for UNEP. She will be followed by a stellar panel uh, of scientific and policy experts and leaders. Uh, and we hope that they will uh, open our eyes to some of the uh, unfolding consequences um, of the pandemic, but also of accelerating climate change and of the need to drastically cut our fossil fuel use. How can this nexus of issues be addressed in an equitable way? Before I hand over to Professor Gupta, uh, we will first hear some brief opening remarks also from our partners, uh, Jaren K. Hansson, uh, Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and uh, Johan Schielenstjerna, Senior Advisor and Adjunct Professor at Stockholm University. So, Jaren, over to you. Thank you, Osa, and hello, everyone. You're very welcome to this year's uh, Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture. I usually have the privilege of welcoming you to the uh, Academy's lecture hall for this occasion. But this year is different and we will have to rely on video technology due to the pandemic. And nevertheless, we are of course all looking forward to Dr. Gupta's lecture on fossil fuel and pandemics, a very timely topic indeed. But before we move on to the lecture, let me tell you a few words about Gordon Goodman, whose memory we honor with this lecture. Now, Gordon Goodman was a British ecologist and professor of applied biology in London. And in 1977, he became the founding director of the Bayer Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, the Bayer Institute focused on ecology and uh, issues of environment. And here in Stockholm, Gordon Goodman made important contributions to problems of energy supply, pollution, acidification, how to solve them, just to mention some of his research interests. And he also realized that environmental, particularly climate issues, have political solutions and that scientists need to convince political leaders to act on these issues. And therefore, together with Bert Boulin and others, Gordon Goodman organized a series of meetings that led to the establishment of the IPCC in the mid 80s. At the same time, Dr. Goodman worked for the Brundtland Commission, wrote the energy chapter of his report and helped establishing the term sustainable development. When the Swedish government then set up the Stockholm Environment Institute, Dr. Goodman was asked to be its director and he moved there in 1989 and continued work on energy related topics, sustainable agriculture, biotechnology, and much else. He stepped down as director uh, in 1991 and later moved back to England 
and he passed away 12 years ago. Now, Gordon Goodman combined a profound knowledge of biology and chemistry and environmental science with a drive to help making the world a better place. Of course, we need people like him more than ever, and it's crucial, as also also mentioned, that this kind of work continues also in these difficult times when mankind is afflicted by a pandemic. Now, it's, it's very appropriate that this year's Gordon Goodman lecturer is Dr. Juhi Tagupta, because with her commitment to global climate issues and, and her work with the IPCC, she plays a similar role today as Dr. Goodman did in the 1980s. We are very happy that she accepted our invitation, that she continues the legacy of Dr. Goodman, and we of course all look forward very much to a lecture today. Thank you. And now over to you all. Sorry, thank you very much, Osa. And Joran, I'm also very pleased to welcome you to the Gordon Goodman uh, lecture on, and seminar on behalf of the Stockholm University. Maybe a bit in the shadow of the pandemic, 2020 is actually heading to become one of the top three in terms of the hottest years since 1880. This continues a trend with 19 of the 20 warmest years occurring since 2000. And we know if we are to limit the worst effects of climate change, global emissions will need to reach net zero by the middle of this century. For decades, we have talked about the significant investment gap that remains to bridge national commitments with the emissions reductions needed. Now we have a new situation unfolding with the pandemic that, is, that has led to a global crisis of multiple dim dimensions, as Osa mentioned. As a response, governments are unlashing unprecedented financial, emergency and investment packages to tackle the socioeconomic effects of the pandemic. One can maybe reflect how this situation has mobilized financial resources um, that we could only dream of six months ago. And in terms of investment, when we talked about uh, climate change, it is therefore important to focus on how um, what kind of how we can move from just short time uh, crisis response and enable more long term investments opportunities. Is it possible to steer investments to both respond to the immediate crisis from the pandemic while at the same time driving low carbon development and maximizing benefits to society at large? The pandemic has further accentuated a number of worrying economic, political and social trends that are also important to consider from a climate change driven transition point of view. Increasing political tensions within and between countries stressed public balance sheets, social unrest, populism, just to mention a few. These examples demonstrate why the question on how to combine the development of a low carbon economy with the goals of the welfare state is more important than ever. It gives me also therefore great pleasure to hand over now to Dr. Yujita Gupta, Professor in Environment and Development in the Global South at the University of Amsterdam. She will deliver the 2020 Gordon Goodman lecture with the title Tackling Tough Trade-Offs While Leaving No One Behind on Fossil Fuels and Pandemics. I'll, I'll leave over to you, Professor Gopla. Thank you. Dear online viewers, as a tribute to Gordon Goodman, I will focus on tough trade-offs. I will discuss leaving no one behind. Can we move to the next sheet? leaving no one behind, win-win versus tough trade-offs. And you're probably wondering what I mean by win-win. Well, in a world where we focus on the possible politics or the politics of the possible, we tend to focus much more on win-win rather than on tackling tough trade-offs. So I'll introduce that. Then I'll talk about climate change and focus a little bit on the question of how do we leave fossil fuels underground? Then I look at broader environmental challenges. I look at the opportunities that COVID-19 provide and then draw some conclusions. So one of the silver linings that we have is Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. This is because it calls for leaving no one behind. And in fact, 
even helping the furthest behind first. This basically calls for redistribution of resources and wealth. Well, we live in a complicated world. We have limited land, water, strategic minerals, fertile soils. We even have limited sinks. We cannot keep polluting our oceans, our lands, and our air. We have planetary boundaries and phase tipping points. All this basically means that we have limited environmental utilization space or limited eco space. And in fact, this limited eco space might even be shrinking. At the same time, we have rising demand. And this basically implies that we will have to redistribute this limited eco space amongst the different users and demanders. Now, we also live in a changing world with persistent inequality problems. From a North-South perspective, during the colonial era, the North wanted the resources of the South and even humans for the slave trade. In the post-colonial era, trade agreements often disenfranchised the South. When China became rich, President Trump even argued that free trade was not in line with America first. Today, issues of equitable sharing of resources, for example, how do we share the right to use fossil fuels, the equitable sharing of risks, how do we share the risks of climate impacts, the equitable sharing of responsibilities, who is liable and who is responsible, are not so much discussed at the international level, and instead, we end up with a de facto inequitable sharing of these rights, responsibilities, and risks. We have not discussed who can use the remaining fossil fuels, and as the bulk of the remaining fossil fuels are in the global south, the burden of not using the resource falls on them. And northern countries tend to avoid this redistribution discussion. Of course, some countries in the South may join the North. Some Northern countries may become Southern, and the boundary may change between these two. But history affects future discussions, and this will affect the relationship between North and South. And of course, there are rich people in the South, and there are poor people in the North. If you look at the rich, well, 2,000 billionaires own more than 4.6 billion people. If you look at the poor, well, more than half the world lives on less than $5.5 per day. As Leonard Cohen says, the rich have their channels in the bedrooms of the poor. The rich tend to shift their profits to avoid paying taxes. Apparently, $500 billion are shipped. They also have around $21 to $30 trillion held in offshore accounts. So from a rich poor perspective, there are four key issues. The rich avoid paying taxes, which impoverishes the state. The rich want deregulation, which reduces the power of the state. The rich want to privatize and commodify nature and public services, which expropriates resources and disempowers the poor. And the rich increasingly try to substitute labor through mechanization and algorithms. And they use pacification strategies. Today, in terms of North-South relations, we also have four different kinds of relationships. First, climate impacts will have more existential effects on the global South. Rules have been changed worldwide, which lead to more land, water, and resource grabbing from people in the global north or rich people in the global south in relation to others in the global south. We also have the problem of stranded resources. We now tell the south they can't use their forests. We are going to tell them in the future they can't use their fossil fuels. And we will also be telling them probably that they can't eat meat or even sell meat. And this is not a joke. I remember that when we were discussing with policymakers from the global south, the policymakers summary 
for the global environment outlook, there was a sentence that said that in order to address environmental problems, we would have to encourage the rich countries to eat less meat. And southern negotiators protested because that would have an impact on their exports. And another big problem that we have in the North-South context is the problem of growing debt. In the North, we don't have that many options to spend our money. And as a result, even interest rates have become negative for most of us. But when we lend money to the Global South, we charge higher interest rates. And often we use this money for fossil fuel investments. And so you are seeing that national governments in the Global North are using export credit to finance fossil fuel projects in the Global South, which helps Northern industry export more or less obsolete technology to the Global South. But this leads them into a technology um, lock-in. It leads them into greater debt towards the Global North, and it will also make it very, very difficult for them to actually develop. And this is perhaps a form of neocolonialism. And I have this currency note in front of me, which you can see in the sheet, which basically says that the history of colonialism goes in parallel with the creation of new commodities, slavery, sugar, tea, coffee, oil, and carbon. And if you look at the bottom of the sheet, it basically says that this bill is solely for the purpose of increasing corporate profits, and not really for solving problems like climate change. So, viewers, we live in an unequal world with limited or shrinking ecospace. And when you have such limits, how do you redistribute? You can redistribute using markets, but then only the rich can benefit, only they can buy. Sometimes governments will redistribute by saying they are going to focus on permanent sovereignty as Agenda 20 says, 2030 says. Also, you can also talk about, for example, the idea of polycentricity, which allows for multiple governance options at multiple levels of governance. But this also doesn't really tackle the redistribution issue. And finally, you have Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, which talk of reducing poverty and reducing inequality, but don't actually operationalize how this is going to happen. And so this brings me to the politics of the possible, the politics of small wins and nudges. Policymakers have limited resources, so they want to solve problems using win-win approaches. But this obscures trade-offs. It obscures the fact that there are people who lose. The policy, the politics of the possible focuses on symptoms, not systemic causes, incrementalism, not structural change, creative ambiguity, not clarity of dictum, lean government, not accountable government, public private partnerships, not partnership with the poor, and they use a pro-poor policy that hides a pro-rich strategy. The politics of the possible generates huge non-decisions and de facto allocates resources, risks, and responsibilities. And this basically means that the less powerful tend to lose. So what are then all these tough trade-offs? Let us talk about the clouds of climate change. Climate change can be seen as a systemic problem, a problem of neoliberal capitalism, or even perhaps sustainable development. The system then has drivers, production, consumption, investment, trade, demographic drivers. These drivers then lead to emissions from greenhouse gas sources, from the energy sector, the transport sector, buildings, industry, and land use. These sources then add up to concentrations. And these concentrations then lead to global warming, which has impacts, and such impacts will have residual impacts. Now, when negotiators focus on a win-win narrative, 
they tend to focus only on symptoms, the greenhouse gas sources, energy, transport, buildings, etc. And this is a challenge because as a consequence of this, they avoid discussing the drivers and the system. So what you see is that even though the climate change regime talks about sustainable development, it does not show whether this is compatible with growth or neoliberal capitalism. And even though the Paris Agreement does talk about enhancing coherence in financial investment and financial patterns, it doesn't go far enough in actually addressing the issue. And after 25 years of discussion, we finally have a temperature target, but we didn't translate that into how much fossil fuel can be actually used. And all our discussions on equitable distribution of emission targets have finally given up in favor of what countries are actually willing to do. We have not discussed who is allowed to use the remaining fossil fuels. And big financial actors have remained under the radar. Now, if you want to solve climate change, then clearly you have to leave 80% of the fossil fuels underground. And this will have huge consequences. Such fossil fuels and the entire fossil fuel enterprise is probably worth something up to 300 billion US dollars. Um, Current global, uh, well, the global GDP last year was something to the effect of 85, 86, 87 trillion dollars. So this is significantly more. Now, if you want to achieve 1.5 to 2 degrees, you might lose up to 185 trillion US dollars. Who's going to pay for this? Who is going to strand these assets? Who is going to leave these fossil fuels underground? This overvaluation is referred to as the carbon bubble. Now, suppose you and I have shares in fossil fuels, we are locked up in a prisoner's dilemma. If large investors announce that they will sell their shares, the price of these shares of fossil fuels will fall. And so they have to do it quietly and pretend they're not selling. And people will buy because they think that the global divestment movement has not yet started. But this brings me to a tough question. Should we write off this fossil fuel shares or should we divest? After all, someone will have to pay. Now, multinationals with fossil fuel assets, they obviously want to use these fossil fuels before they move on to renewable energy. Pension funds and other shareholders have huge resources, lots of power, but they don't know whether to write off or divest because they are also facing the prisoner's dilemma. And most fossil fuel assets <coughs> are in the hands of states. And this brings me to the north-south aspects of the fossil fuel discussion. What we find is that as most remaining fossil fuel resources are in the global south, if we are to phase it out, basically, the South will have to face the opportunity cost of such phase out. When we sell our shares in the fossil fuel industry, we're basically also shifting these shares to the global South because most of the time it is Southern investors that are purchasing these shares. And since so much knowledge and technology exists in the global North, global North governments are using aid export credit and investments and loans to support their own industry to sell this technology to the global south. And this basically means that the global south will have to eventually get rid of all these fossil fuels and it has a dilemma. If it gets rid of these fossil fuels, how will it pay back all the loans it has taken from the global north? And if it doesn't phase out the fossil fuels, well, they are at the receiving end of climate change. So they will have greater existential challenges in the future. But it's also in our interest to make sure that these countries do not get stronger vested interests in keeping this fossil fuel story alive. And this basically is a challenge. It's a cloud on the horizon, but there is hope. There is 
a silver lining. Worldwide, we are finding that there are increasing numbers of court cases on climate change and CO2 emissions. And if you look at the global south, then you find that in democratic countries, there are increasing numbers of court cases being used by social movements to try to make governments and fossil fuel producers and users aware of this problem. So I think that where legislatures and executives worldwide have become paralyzed, there is some hope as people are using the judiciary. Let's now discuss broader environment and development issues. In 2019, UNEP produced the Healthy Planet, Healthy People report. This report concludes that a healthy planet enables healthy humans. The planet is becoming increasingly unhealthy. An unhealthy planet affects our health. The structural causes of an unhealthy planet therefore need to be addressed. And a healthy planet and healthy people are synergistic. Now, if we look at how an unhealthy planet affects our health, we see a large number of statistics that are available. Can you move to the next sheet, please? For example, 25% of all health impacts can be related to environmental pollution. And disasters have killed 0.7 million people between 2005 and 2015, affecting 1.7 billion people and costing about 1.4 trillion US dollars. And in 2016, environmental disasters displaced 26.2 million people, three times more than other conflict causes. Air pollution has killed 7 million people annually with a welfare loss of 5 trillion US dollars. Land degradation affects 3.2 billion people with a welfare loss of 4 to 20 trillion dollars. 1.4 million people die annually because of water pollution. And 90% of disasters are slow onset disasters caused, for example, by drought or antibiotic resistance. Unhealthy planet and healthy oceans provide 3.1 billion people with 20% of their protein needs. Pollinators, which are valued at about $200 billion per annum, are declining, and this decline is affecting food security. Our report also shows that zoonotic disease is 60% of all infectious disease. COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. So what you're seeing is that we need to address the health of humans by addressing the health of the planet. And the GEO identifies the pursuit of economic growth and related production and consumption patterns, as well as technologies, as key drivers of ecological degradation. Addressing these structural drivers is therefore critical. The data in the report also can be used to show that the privileged contribute much more to the drivers and pressures of environmental degradation than the marginalized do. And I'm not just talking about how the privileged produce and consume, but also how they invest, how their pensions are used for investing in these drivers and pressures. And at the same time, the privileged suffer much less in existential terms than the marginalized. They may suffer in dollar terms more, but in existential terms, they suffer much less. And this basically brings us to a tough question, which is how are the rich going to compensate or are they going to pacify the poor? After all, someone has to pay. Now the rich are completely fixated by the idea that economic growth is necessary. And then they also don't want to pay compensation. So they move from compensation to pacification and use a pro-poor policy to hide the poor, pro-rich strategy. Let me explain by building upon the growth narratives. And let me look at sustainable development. Well, 
Sustainable development is supposed to help us find the happy medium between the social, the economic, and the ecological. But only the economic is actually valued in monetary terms. And so every time we try to apply sustainable development in practice, we end up prioritizing the economy over social and ecological aspects. If you look at the concept of inclusive growth, which is let's focus on growth and then do a little bit of inclusion, and we do that inclusion through poor, poor strategies, then we find that this doesn't work either because the growth takes place very often at the cost of the poor. If you look at green growth, well, green growth tries to say, let's keep growing, but make sure that that growth is green. And the idea is that you can somehow de-link economic growth from pollution or from resource use. And this can be done through this idea of circular economy. But if our world consists of three main systems, the energy system, the food system, and uh, the resource and waste system, then we find that the energy system cannot really be subject to a circular economy because energy dissipates. The food system cannot be subject to a circular economy because we digest it. I mean, it's a long shot to really get that circular. And the resource and waste economy is also difficult to make circular. So this is also a challenge. I think that we really have to revisit the concept of what is green. I think that if we want to leave no one behind, we need to go beyond pro-poor policy and move towards systemic change for social and ecological inclusion. And not only that, we will have to redistribute, but if those in power are doing the redistribution, they're unlikely to do anything else than pro-poor policy. So basically, we need to find social movements and try to encourage them to participate more actively in this entire debate debate. And this basically means that any social, ecological, and relational inclusiveness process implies that we have to redefine what development is. In the meanwhile, the global governance system is paralyzed. The legal system is paralyzed. International private law is much more important in many ways than international public law. For example, if you have a contract, a long-term contract, with a fossil fuel company, it's going to be very difficult to actually phase out the use of fossil fuels because you'll have to compensate that company for not using the fossil fuel. And international public law seems to be very incremental, moving towards limited sovereignty, but it's sort of reversing back now towards permanent sovereignty. It's not moving forward really on no harm, uh, the no harm principle or the equity principle. And public environmental law is quite adaptive to the US reluctance to do anything serious on environmental issues. And I'm not just talking about the last government in the United States, but for a long time, the US has been reluctant on this issue. International law is just not able to deal with the transformation that we need. In this PowerPoint, I show you what the GEO has in its, his, in its uh, report, a slight modification. Basically, what we see is that current governance trends are not going to lead to more sustainability. We are having more and more uh, uh, unsustainable trends in our future. To get to a sustainable world, we actually need systemic change, structural change. The blue line shows you the structural change that can lead to living within planetary boundaries and the other line I had in that diagram was to emphasize the fact that we also need to think about a safe and just planet. And this translates into different development paths for different countries, as the next slide shows. So essentially, we can't have developing countries sort of develop in a linear progression towards becoming an industrialized country. All countries, whether poor or rich, have to move towards lower environmental degradation, lower resource use, while trying to enhance development for everybody. And I'm not talking growth. So this basically brings me to the next issue, which is the silver lining. And that is uh, the fact 
that social movements have been putting pressure on governments to stop investing in public private partnerships or even the privatization of water services and instead go back to the remunicipalization of water services and we are seeing this also in the developed world so it is time to take back some of these public goods into public hands and ensure that these services are uh, provided by the state this brings me now to my other silver lining which is covid-19 which is clearly a cloud but there is a silver lining let me show you what i mean covid-19 has already punctured the carbon bubble with share prices coming down shareholder equity coming down companies closing capital expenditure reduced so basically we are seeing that covid-19 can have an impact on climate change and can fasten the transition to renewables covid-19 is also leading to a fall in the gdp and we know that governments will spend probably 10 to 20% of their gdp for the recovery process and the question is will they focus this recovery process on a vicious cycle or on a virtuous cycle let me explain will governments now use this 10 to 20% of their budget for emphasizing growth over well-being health and ecosystem emphasizing the lean state and commodifying and privatizing the environment and health will they focus on state goals such as china and world health organization with respect to the covid-19 crisis will they focus on only issues that the rich can do such as social distancing which is not possible in a slum will they focus on sovereignty and securitization and lifeboat ethics and not share the the drugs that eventually get developed for addressing uh covid-19 will they use up their fossil fuels so that there's nothing left for the south to use or will they use this money to emphasize the health of the planet and the health of the people will they use it for treating health and environment as merit and public goods will they focus on the structural and systemic pressures the causes of zoonosis land use change the causes of climate change will they focus on the state and impact and address the vulnerabilities of the poor not by pro poor policy but by actually redistributing resources and will they focus on global solidarity to address this global problem and that brings me to my conclusion the world has focused for a long time on easy solutions win win solutions incremental change but this postpones the needed decisions and the day factor transfers risk the day factor transfers risks to the global poor the longer the world focuses on win win the higher the lock in the greater the damage to the poor the more expensive it will be to resolve these problems social movements and academics must play a critical role in balancing the power of the great and large investors covid-19 provides this opportunity this opportunity is very brief we may have only one or two years in which to do it but it is a very large opportunity because it has 10 to 20% of the global gdp this is the moment for action and we must act now because if we are as academics and social movements passive the recovery process will reproduce past injustices we must not build back better we must catalyze climate resilient change we must avoid further environmental degradation and inequality lock in thank you for your attention Joyita thank you so much for a fascinating lecture and for covering so many different topics that make us think really critically i think we have a really exciting panel lined up that can discuss some of the things that you mentioned so um i think i should introduce myself first my name is Meidazin Ao and i'm a research fellow at SEI Asia in Bangkok 
So I do a number of different research topics, but mainly I work on energy transitions and water resources management. Um, and I'd like to introduce the panel first, but afterwards I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about how we can engage more in this panel discussion through a poll. So um, first I'd like to introduce Ulrika Modier. Ulrika is an Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Bureau of External Relations and Advocacy at UNDP. She leads the UNDP's strategic partnerships with government, civil society, and other key partners and has a vital role in leading UNDP's communications and advocacy in over 170 countries. In Sweden, she has been instrumental in reshaping Sweden's International Development Corporation to support the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. So thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce Nonette Royo. Nonette is the Executive Director of the Tenure Facility. She's a lawyer, activist, and author specializing in the land rights of indigenous people and community-based natural resources management. In the past two decades, Nonnet has pioneered civil society initiatives in public interest law and environmental justice in Philippines, Indonesia, and mainland Southeast Asia. So thank you very much for joining Nonnet. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jonas Ed Everson. He is a professor of environmental law, the former dean of the Faculty of Law and director of Stockholm Environmental Law and Policy Center at Stockholm University. He is also the chair of the Compliance Committee to the UN Economic Commission for Europe, our host convention on participatory rights in environmental matters. This research focuses on transboundary dimensions of environmental law and he is currently co-editing a comprehensive volume on Agenda 2030, the SDGs and the international law. So we very much look forward to your book. And last but not least, we have SEI's very own Shivan Kartha, who is from SEI US. He's a senior scientist focusing on economic, political and ethical dimensions of fairly sharing the effort on an ambitious global climate action. He has worked with a wide range of international institutions and civil society organizations and served as a coordinating lead author for IPCC's fifth assessment report, co-leading the chapter on equity and sustainable development. He is now an author for the forthcoming sixth assessment report. So we're very excited to have such a wonderful lineup of panelists. So but I have some questions prepared for them. But before we dive into the discussion, I'd like to establish some house rules. So um, some of you have already been engaged in the Q&A section there on the right. You can please post your Q&A Q&A's. Um, when you do post, please state your name, organization and country. And the questions will not be posted automatically. Um, we will review them before we publish them. And uh, in case you do miss part of this lecture, we have been recording it, so that will be available to you afterwards. Um, so you'll see on the screen that there is an audience poll. That is your way to engage with us on some of the important topics that Joyita has raised. So if you go to menti.com, um, I suggest that you use your phone or any other electronic device um, that you can access uh, the website menti.com. So enter in this code 6033828 and you will be presented with a list of questions for a poll. And the question is, what type of solutions should we focus on in tackling complex global socio-ecological challenges in a post-COVID era? Should we focus on the possible, the small wins and the nudges, or the win-win solutions? or addressing the tough trade-offs, or all or a mixture of the above. So we will come back to these questions after uh, we've had a round of discussion with the panelists. OK, so let me jump straight into it. Shivan, I know you're an expert on these matters, and Joyita discussed the question of equity around the sharing of fossil fuels and the necessity of leaving 80% of fossil fuels in the ground if we seriously want to tackle climate change. And 
So what to you, what are the key considerations in ensuring the equitable use of fossil fuels to tackle climate change? Um, thank you, May and Andrita. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think in some ways you you answered this question even better than uh, um, than than I could, having been working on this. Um, you did a brilliant job, Dreta, of laying out the scale of the challenge of of phasing out fossil fuels um, and the and the stakes. Um, 185 trillion dollars in fossil fuel assets that would need to be stranded more than more than twice the current gross world product. Um, so the the importance of doing it equitably um, really can't be can't be overstated. There is a question to be asked: Is it is it possible? Um, well, it's it's just as possible to scale down fossil fuel production at at uh, at that rate at the necessary rate as it is to um, reduce emissions that we've we have um, there are plenty of analyses looking at the technical issues and the economic issues and and showing where energy services can be provided from so it can be done um, can it be done equitably and I think a strong case can be made that given energy markets as they function today and given politics as usual, um, it wouldn't happen equitably. That the COVID crisis and the, the um, energy price wars that were occurring in the lead up to the COVID crisis showed us a glimpse of the scale of disruption that would happen if fossil fuels were scaled down rapidly at um, in, a, in a manner that didn't rely on on any kind of of cooperation that was purely um, every country for itself and every region for itself. Um, but it can be done much, much more equitably than that. Um, it can be done in a way that isn't um, based solely on minimizing unit energy costs and that looks at the transition costs. Um, what are the various types of disruption, of social disruption that could happen if fossil fuel production was scaled down at the rate that would be needed to keep warming below uh, two degrees or, or one and a half degrees with, with a high level of, of certainty? Um, it can be done much more equitably if we recognize that just as when we talk about mitigation, um, countries differ phenomenally, that there is a, a wide range um, of countries with respect to their reliance on fossil fuel production. And that range can, I think it can best be characterized in terms of two key features. And one is, what is the scale of this disruption that a country would undergo if it needed to rapidly phase down fossil fuel production? Um, how entrenched is the fossil fuel production sector um, and and linked sectors to the economy as a whole, to the generation of employment, to the securing of people's livelihoods, um, to the provision of, of government revenue uh, to provide public services. Um, some countries are much more dependent than, than others are. Um, countries like the US and Canada and the UK rely for fossil fuel revenues um, um, about a negligible few percent, a couple of percent of their government revenue. Whereas other countries like uh, Timor-Leste and DR Congo, um, Angola rely on revenues for half or more than half 
of their government revenue. Um, in Iraq, it's it's uh, approaching 90% of government revenue, and it's that government government revenue that provides basic social services like health care and education and disaster response. Um, and in the time of COVID, those resources are being especially heavily relied upon. So a rapid phase we out. Have two minutes. OK, thank you. A rapid phase out would be extremely disruptive. Um, um, but the, another dimension of differences is sort of the 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 way of squaring that circle and resolving the problem about the the extreme differences and the scale of the challenge and that's the the wherewithal the financial and technological wherewithal the resources that countries have to deal with a rapid and potentially disruptive transition and obviously some are um, much more um, well equipped to deal with a rapid transition like that. And just as with on the greenhouse gas emission side, the way of, of squaring that circle between these vast differences in, in the scale of the challenge for different countries um, um, is, is precisely through the vast differences in the resources that are available in different countries. It really comes down to a matter of international cooperation. As Joita said, um, there aren't really um, go it alone lifeboat type solutions to the common shared sustainability crisis that we face. That the solutions would act that would actually get us to the other side are solutions that rely on cooperation and solidarity. And um, while they may seem in the near term to be um, to be zero sum um, um, uh, solutions, they in the long term are win win solutions. It leaves us with a healthy environment that could actually sustain uh, human society. Um, so I'll I'll leave it at that for now, May. But there's there's certainly much more that could be said about that. And and one place where this will this can be found is in the upcoming um, uh, second volume of the production gap report that SEI in collaboration with a number of other institutes will be will be issuing in a matter of a few months. Thank you so much, Shivan. And I think we'll be able to talk more about the importance of cooperation in the second part of the discussion. Um, so now I now I have a question for Nonet and Jonas. Um, Joita emphasizes the importance of legal systems in ensuring that no one is left behind and uh, gave some examples of uh, regimes and institutions that are maybe not working so well, but also mentioned how court cases are rising. Um, and if you think it is a positive step toward um, keeping states accountable. So I'd like to hear from your perspective, first Jonas and Nanette, uh, Nanette, your different perspectives from working at the international level and also at the, the national level. So Jonas, I'll, I'll start with you first. Thank you, May, and thank you, Joita, for your inspiring lecture. I agree with the concerns you raise and also mostly with your description of the state of play. I was asked to comment on the legal dimension and I will only address a few such points. And in doing so, there are three important starting points, also indicated by Professor Gupta. First, while I focus on the law, power structures and imbalances, often among states and corporations and policy choices are of course essential for governance of these issues. And the law may work to allow or curb such structures. Second, the tough trade-offs, the ambition of leaving no one behind, and the concerns for justice mentioned play in at different levels and scales simultaneously. That is, these issues must be addressed both at the global scale and in global context and in national and even local contexts in parallel. Third, international law works in different ways. In some cases, it, it promotes unsustainable activities and action, whether by states or non-state actors. In other cases, while not promoting certain actions with adverse impact, international law allows unsustainable actions, which can be problematic enough. And in 
some cases, international law prevents unsustainable actions and measures. Finally, in some instances, international law prevents measures intended to promote environment and health protection and policies to promote sustainable development. And depending on how laws stand, of course, it triggers different kinds of problems. Many of the examples mentioned by Professor Gupta refers to situations where international law is not necessarily directing or forcing in the wrong way, but rather where international law is ambiguous or allows actors to act in ways that should be avoided because they are unfair or unsustainable. This, of course, could be a reason for the reforming international law. In many cases, though, international law also allows actions that would be more sustainable and fair within the same legal framework. Professor Gupta argued that the global legal system is paralyzed. On this point, I both agree and disagree. The increasing private transnational investments show that international law is not paralyzed, but may be abused so as to move in the wrong direction, which is, of course, problematic. International law does not prevent transnational private investments, rather the contrary. What we don't see enough of, however, is that host states put strong enough conditions on these new investments or prevents them if they so wish. Conditions on climate change, environment protection, labor standards and human health. International law would not prevent that, but states do not make use of their rights always, and there is not strong enough public pressure to do so. There are certain legal structures that could make it difficult, but generally speaking, such possibilities are there for the states. At the same time, I agree with Professor Gupta about international law being, in a way, paralyzed. In many ways, international law uh, would need to be changed to reach what she was asking for, but in many cases, um, international law is not used to the extent possible to ensure that no one is left behind. For instance, neither the principle of no harm mentioned or the principle of common but differentiated responsibility is obsolete. They are still part of the law. Rather, what is missing is that too few states or other actors invoke these principles in legal and political context. I will give three specific examples to illustrate how international law work and how it may work with the bearing on redistribution of resources, options, etc. The first is that of multilateralism in international law. International law is complex. It's a system based on uncoordinated treaty regimes, agreed concepts and principles, and accepted and respected customary law, sometimes reflected in the jurisprudence of courts. It applies in asymmetrical ways, in some cases with treaty regimes of 200 states, in other cases with only two parties. I think multilateralism is key to address Professor Gupta's concern. Not only can power imbalances be addressed more effectively and fairly through multilateralism, it also promotes the legitimacy of international law. So now, when some major players like the USA are moving towards bilateralism, for instance in trade negotiations, I think it is important that the international community insists and continues to push for multilateral outcomes. Take the case of international trade law, which matters a lot for the issues raised. I can spend a full day criticizing the World Trade Organization. For instance, I find it unacceptable that today, under the WTO, any state should be able to benefit from principles of free trade and non-discrimination, even if their production of goods involves child labor, massive pollution, and apparent violations of international human rights law, labor rights, or environment protection. We have two minutes left. One of the areas and institutions which should be reviewed in light of Professor Gupta's point. Having said that, I don't think the solution would be to move away from multilateralism towards bilateral negotiations, which most often favor the stronger party. My second point is on justice. Professor Gupta argued that equitable distribution of emission targets has been given up in favor of what countries are willing to do. I'm equally concerned about this approach, and I think there are a lot of shortcomings in the Paris agreements. Um, as pointed out by Professor Gupta, it may well obstruct trade-offs and also it shows uh, it's a case of creating ambiguity and so on. However, and I also sympathize with the notions of common and differentiated responsibility set up in the previous protocol, the Kyoto Protocol. 
However, I don't think that that approach is a way to go back to, to build on in the future, because it only looked at justice matters on the interstate basis. And in some cases, it could even promote domestic injustices while allowing certain states um, uh, not to do very much, because there was so unfair distribution of resources and emissions within the countries. So if we are moving further on, on the notion of common but differentiated responsibilities, it must not stop at state borders or be limited to state. It must include also individuals and members of the public. This brings me to my last point. Professor Gupta mentioned the increasing role of national courts also in the South. And I think this is an important point. It's not only a sign that judiciaries are stepping in, but more importantly of a global movement where non-state actors, not least civil society, use the law and refers also to international law in local and regional settings. This has a huge impact on the law itself because it pushes the legal development and the need to construe legal concepts in light of new circumstances. But, and one of those issues is for instance to apply human rights law to climate change. But, and this is my last point, I think that the lawsuits may reflect something even more significant than a change of legal thinking. Maybe the lawsuits in parallel to all the climate change manifestations on the streets and other forms of climate change engagement indicate a social or societal tipping point or the reaching of a threshold leading to a fundamental significant and radical change of the views of climate change policy viability and rights. More generally, this reflects what has been described as international law from below Focusing mainly on local or regional context and on human rights and climate change, this is a welcome legal development in addition to the global negotiations. I think that more such actions from below are fundamental to address global matters and international law, also in local contexts, so that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Nonet, do you want to talk about your experiences using local law and uh, customary law, um, just to segue from the point that uh, Jonas talked about. Uh, Nonette, are you there? If you're not available, we can come back to you. I am available. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jonas, uh, for the points that you raised uh, about bottom up legislation and practice that really is the focus of what we do and I've done the last 30 years. Uh, Customary law in itself is not standalone. It is essentially part and parcel of what the legal basis of our work in protecting and uh, recognizing rights uh, of peoples and uh, particularly indigenous peoples and local communities and their environment and the, and the regimes that they protect. And these are landscapes. The, areas that we realize are crucial and in my experience has been as an anthropological lawyer is the area of the interface between formal laws and customary indigenous uh, uh, laws and this uh, this interface is actually uh, a package of justice systems that uh, in by and large had become uh, the part and parcel and the pillars of what is the silver lining that uh, Professor Yuita has mentioned. Uh, in, in our experience and uh, personally, in my experience as, uh, as a practitioner in uh, 30 years back, we found the elements of that really is an understanding that uh, formal legal systems are the entry points and that is uh, applicable if, and uh, these are the pillars, there is a basic understanding, information uh, of an organized polity, and that is uh, communities, indigenous peoples, civil society, um, that 
is uh, accessible. And the accessibility is in a lot of ways in the capacity of uh, people to use the information and to use the laws and the resources to do that. So this silver lining does not come on its own in a passive way. And this is what we have emphasized as what social movements have to, to kick in. But over time, it also requires uh, not just, so it requires the interfa in relationship of people and land. Um, big areas right now, the last remaining forest stands in Asia, Africa, and Latin America uh, are managed and occupied by people. And these are not just ordinary people. These are local communities, indigenous people. Their exercise of responsibility toward land, even before rights are in place, uh, have been seen, and now a lot more uh, journals and articles have shown that, been seen as crucial to manage and um, get us over the hump in, in our challenges in handling climate change. Nature solutions are, the, are, are one of the most important ones and recognized. So what, we, what ha we have learned over time is because this is not passive, because this requires organizing, there needs to be an investment of time and resources to build that capacity to make information much more accessible and to translate the interface. So the state responsibility and accountability to respond to this sustainability challenges and to protection of its own people and natural resources uh, will and will only be made possible if we, the, if civil society and the people who occupy directly the land, not just the advocates, take a stand and demand that responsibility. And, and so over time, there have been cases. So the, the court cases are not just happening now. Over time, we have observed this, and particularly for the tenure facility right now, existing regulations is the entry point, but the application of that is relying a lot on customary and informal systems. So, for, for example, uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice, the highest court in Belize, was able to recognize the rights of the Maya people vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, this expansion of false fossil fuel exploration in the area. And that's the, that's the, essentially the crossing between uh, decision and implementation. The Tenure Facility, for example, in this particular case, has provided the resources to implement that decision. So, so it can't, the silver lining, the decisions in the courts, uh, that, is, that is, that's, yeah, that's important, as well as the ability for those decisions to be executed uh, and implemented. And the resources required for that is uh, continually a challenge. So uh, states are responding, and yes, the international law, as uh, Professor uh, Jonas had said, it is kicking in and supporting the the essentially the the basis for the pressure and the governments are aligning but people is and and people not just by themselves but organized accessing justice formal and informal as well as uh, resourced are very important in the process and, and it is long term, it's not short term, and it's not just about the North and the South, and which I agree though that they are important, but it's not just the North and the South, it's largely the rich and the poor, and between that there are layers as well. Yeah, so it is, it is, um, it is a situation that calls for uh, a broader look at what people can do together and understanding that it's not gonna be a short, short term solution. And I think I'll stop there and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think you have highlighted a perfect segue into some of the actions that we can take. And um, I'll ask Elrika about that. So um, Joita described COVID-19 as a possible silver lining for us to take action. How do you think we can actually build forward or build back better 
um, that is different from the business as usual solution. What is already being done and what else can we do? Uh, thank you so much for that tricky question, I must say, and let's see if I can provide some ideas for our discussion. But first of all, taking the opportunity to thank the organizers and, and uh, Dr. Gupta also for your inspiring lecture that is thought provoking. And this is, I think, what we need in these times. Uh, incremental change or disruption, win-win or tough trade-offs. I mean, that's really what we need to discuss also and making use of the platform of United Nations. And thank you also, Jonas, for mentioning that multilateralism matters and that we need multilateral solution to the global challenges, even though sometimes it's not even incremental change, but we are moving in reverse. And I just wanted to remind us, as I was thinking about uh, you when you were saying, Jujita, that we live in an in unequal world with limited eco space. Uh, when we took stock of the progress of the Sustainable Development Goals during General Assembly last year, uh, we could certainly see that the areas where we're actually going in reverse are the areas with regard to inequality and environment and climate change. And since then, of course, with the pandemic, uh, we are also seeing much more people uh, living in extreme poverty. We're talking about 100 million people being pushed into extreme poverty. And we also see increasing hunger in the world of today. Now, perhaps also uh, to, to say that this is perhaps not only about North and South, because when we look at the unequal world, we see inequality increasing in all parts of the world. And this is certainly a problem when we are to create policies and trust in our societies for the policies to be put into uh, reforms and, and uh, legislative uh, changes. Uh, UNDP has through our human development report uh, that we uh, uh, presented in December last year, uh, uh, looked at inequalities across our economies, uh, north, south, east, west and what we see, of course, is increasing inequalities in, in all economies. And we have also looked at the major risks with regard to increasing inequalities. And we were already then pointing also at the importance of climate change, climate justice, uh, but also, and this has not been mentioned in our discussion, the importance on the digital divide. And I think that this is certainly something that we have seen also coming as a very strong uh, divider in times of COVID, uh, where we are as now connected, but just looking at our school children across the world in the Global South, nine out of 10 children, and you can then just imagine the gender aspects of this are not connected to online schooling as we speak and as the pandemic goes on. Uh, the UN uh, has responded through our health response uh, led by WHO, uh, the humanitarian response led by OCHA and United Nations Development Program UNDP has been given the responsibility on behalf of the Secretary General to start to line out the socio-economic response. And I think that this gives us an opportunity and I would very much like to take also this opportunity to invite all of you listening into this call to be part of it. UNDP has the technical lead, but we need to do this in partnership. The socio-economic response should have been there from the very beginning. We know that so many economies were suffering and people were suffering uh, already before the virus had started to spread in countries. And I think that the response should have started earlier on. But then, of course, as has been said also in this conversation, the limited space uh, available for so many countries, governments uh, to actually uh, respond uh, adequately was not there. And this is also why we see inequalities also being exacerbated uh, alongside with the development of, of the situation in so many economies. Uh, UNDP now, with regard to the response, we have identified four areas that we find are incredibly important uh, for the socioeconomic recovery beyond what we do right now towards also the 2030 goals. And we have then said, and you know UNDP, that governance, and of course this is very much also part of the discussion that we've had here today with regard to legislation, rule of law and so on, need to be part of the response right now. We need to discuss and UNDP will uh, engage even more in the discussion about the social contract between decision makers and citizens. How can we provide new ways of rebuilding that social contract in the midst of times 
uh, where we see so many countries suffering of populism, lack of uh, facts-based discussion and uh, economies in free fall. We have also said that we need to look at uh, social security and we launched and maybe you have seen that. If not, I'm happy to provide uh, you with a link after our, our call here today. Uh, a report where we yeah, a report where we uh, discuss temporary basic income. And just also to link to this discussion, one of the possibilities that we see that could actually also provide funding for uh, the building of, of social protection and the idea, uh, for instance, just one of them of temporary basic income is also with the withdrawal of fossil fuel subsidies. So we would very much like to be part of a discussion where we start to seriously shift investments uh, from uh, fossil fuel subsidies, for instance, into social reforms and see if we can actually pull this off, building on some of the best practices that we see, knowing also then, of course, how difficult this is. Uh, the green recovery is certainly and has from the outset been part of UNDP's uh, proposal and we do this of course in close coordination with UNEP and other, other colleagues, uh, but also then looking at green jobs and, and green recovery that can build that inclusive economy that we have discussed and that is so difficult to build. And then just also at the end to mention uh, the importance of the digital divide and the need to focus on investments also that can repair this digital divide and make it possible for economies of the global south also be, to be part of the more sustainable future. Uh, we are only in the beginning of the crisis uh, and as I said UNDP would very much like to have a fact-based discussion. We want to engage uh, and be that driver of change using uh, the UN platform but then of course bringing in also the IFIs uh, the UN hasn't that much of money as compared to the IFIs, but then of course the larger investment flows. And I would also like to invite you and perhaps I can provide the audience also with a link where you can see our newly set up toolbox with regard to uh, investments uh, to bring about a more sustainable future, moving us beyond recovery and towards the 2030 goals. A lot more to share and say, but thank you so much for the interesting and thoughtful uh, presentations and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulrika. I think we have a lot to discuss um, and I see a lot of questions that are related to some of the actions that we can take. So let's go to the poll question um, and see what the results are. I'm not ready yet. Um, so we don't have a lot of time remaining, so um, I've merged a number of different questions into two major questions. Um, one essentially is about the, the reality or the possibility of um, using win-win solutions. And um, how do we get there? Are multilateral solutions the answer? Um, are public-private partnerships and cooperation some of the, uh, the solutions that we can take? Um, what are you guys' thoughts on actually making sure that we go beyond win-win solutions and that we start addressing some of the, the tough questions and the trade-offs that Joita raised? Would anyone like to take this question? Jonas? Well, unless uh, Joita wanted to, to comment first, I think uh, Joita made a very strong point about certain limits to growth, about planetary boundaries, about limited resources. And I think it is a key point here to make that uh, rather than discussing win-win, if we want to achieve these things globally in legitimate way, if we want um, these measures to be taken, certain parties, certain parts of the world, certain segments of society has to do more than other and it may come with a cost for some to the benefit of other. But at the end, that will, I think, be very helpful um, in the grander global context. I think, again, that w concepts of solidarity in international, in international context is something that should be more frequently referred to and we should be reminded of that, that we cannot create, we cannot move towards sustainability unless the measures taken are seen as fair in particular from those who are worst affected and who have the least resources. And I think that was also, as I got it, 
a key message in Joita's presentation. Joita, would you like to respond to that? Um, well, what I find is that, uh, and not just in response to what you just asked, because these are thoughts that have been presenting in different places. And then somebody told me, well, actually, if you look at the liability for the rich or the North, so I'm talking both about rich, poor and North, South, and my rich, poor are also within countries. Um, the liability for the rich is so great. Um, for the North is so great that it, why can't we just talk instead about peace and reconciliation? Let's forgive the past and then start afresh. But the problem is you can't keep forgiving the past as part of this win-win narrative. And that is where the lack of forgiveness from the global South about the way North has worked of the lack of forgiveness of the poor about the rich how the rich function, whether they're taking away their lands for extractive industries or whether they're taking away their um, their clean air and giving them polluted air back in return. This, this tension is there and that tension is probably the reason why all these social movements are really building up. But um, I wanted to also come back with, I mean, I wanted to bring the issue of um, this, the idea that we can keep growth and then just do a little bit of tinkering on the margin that's a challenge for me. But the other challenge I have is the issue of small government. I really think that if you want to protect um, the rights of people, if you want to ensure that everybody has access to proper health care or even to the Internet or even to um, clean air, clean water, um, you need to have a government that is responsible and does it. And you cannot privatize these aspects. And the whole narrative that has been happening so far is we can do it, governments don't have money, so let's do public-private partnerships. The governments have no money, let the private sector do it. And you can see with that re-municipalization narrative that it has failed even in the West, that uh, the complete privatization of these services does not mean that they will provide these resources for the poor and make it affordable or that they will invest in infrastructure. So for me, the idea of a lean government is also problematic. I want to see an accountable government. Um, and I also want to see much more uh, uh, public health care, not commodifying health care for everybody. You know that, and especially COVID-19 has exposed that because I've just read statistics before COVID-19 that every minute two people in India go into poverty because they can't pay their health bills. That's before COVID-19. So this entire COVID-19 has exposed the need for proper healthcare investments. And for me, uh, I'm, I agree completely with you, Jonas. We can't just have equity stuff at the border. It has to go beyond. And that means that we have to move away from a capitalist narrative that really focuses on more and more wealth to the top, which is what I meant by pro-poor is used to hide uh, unequal societies. We need the tax justice system. We need resources. We need states that are accountable. And uh, to come back to Sivan's point, because Sivan talked about disruption, I think that the win-win, the focus on win-win the whole time has postponed the decisions on fossil fuel uh, so far that whatever we do now is going to be disrupted. But there's a very good chance that the disruption will hurt the Western governments less than it will hurt the Southern governments. And that, for me, is a real problem because we're really de facto without making decisions we have pushed the problem to the global south and that those are challenges for me i just want to come back to one other point that came up i think uh, in jonas's presentation where he said whole states don't put strong enough rules you're right but if you have lean governments in the global south and if you have corrupt governments because i have a feeling that you have to go beyond once you have a government that is reasonably strong, then the government will start investing also in its own accountability. And we really need to invest in government and maybe move away a little bit from governance. And that does not mean, Nanette, that I don't want to respect the customary rights of the poorest and the indigenous communities. I do want to respect them, but I want to have a system where I can hold the government accountable for what it's doing. Uh, but I just looked at export credit, and export credit is something that Western governments give to developing countries and to developed countries. But it's money that they uh, spent 
to in, uh, support their own industries abroad. And what they do is they try to look at the local um, national policies and they try to use those national policies to compete. So the, the fact that these governments have lower policies means that they can export pol um, projects and proposals that don't meet environment impact assessment standards in the West. And that's a sort of a dumping that I think is not appropriate. And so for me, it's really important that uh, we focus on this. And I also think we should come back to the issue of multilateralism. Multilateralism is really important in my view. And my view is also that in the environmental and in the equity world, I'm not convinced that the United States is really a serious partner. I think it's really important for Europe to now make better uh, longer term discussions with the G77 and China and to see whether together we can come to a better description of how or a better understanding of how international law can develop. Thank you, Joy. Uh, I just want to note that I think the, the audience poll is ready. So I think many of us agree that uh, the poll that got the most vote is addressing the top trade offs. And actually, I'd like to ask a question, starting with Shivan, and people can jump in after. Uh, there's, a quest there's a question around um, the reality of dealing with the trade-offs. So if economic growth is no longer the pursuit, what funds the new paradigm? And uh, in relation to that question, you mentioned, Shivan, the countries like Timor-Leste where transition is very difficult. So there's a audience member from Indonesia who says it is very difficult to transition because of um, energy security, economic growth, all of those things dependent on that. Um, do you have any reflections on that, Shivan? Um, the main reflection is um, is simply to agree. It It is ch extremely challenging for a country like East Timor. Um, it's uh, uh, energy reliance, its livelihoods, its government revenue, its the social services that derive from the government revenue, and and that really cannot be um, seen as a set of challenges that uh, Timor Leste can overcome on its own. It would be simply impossible for Timor Leste to do that. And so, if if um, a country such as Timor Leste is to is to forego the production of fossil fuels um, and the the feeding of markets that are that are still still uh, uh, buying fossil fuels and consuming fossil fuels. Um, it will need to be helped to do so. It will need to be helped in the process of diversification. It will be need to. It'll need to have the type of support that will. Um, allow it to continue to provide um, and hopefully expand upon the public services it provides. It'll need um, um, international support to help with expanding its uh, technological capabilities and its human resources and investing in, in human capital. Um, and that applies to many countries that are poor but important producers, Iraq, Nigeria, um, um, yeah, a number, a number of countries, and so if this is, if this is to happen, um, if we're going to have a low carbon transition, um, the only way it can happen is if there is meaningful international support that's, that's um, really has a has a foundation of of true solidarity. What I think of as being extremely encouraging is that when you look at the populations around the world, when you look at, uh, you know, students marching or universities divesting or um, um, cities declaring themselves, you know, on a, on a path to uh, zero carbon, it's clear that there's a lot of support for a real transition. And, and I think that an, an a necessary, an absolutely necessary step in making it a reality is to recognize the power of vested interests to um, to to pin this very inertial system in place. 
um, through their own investments in uh, public miseducation and political lobbying and um, um, funding of of climate skeptics who can really muddy the the discourse. And so understanding the role that vested interests are playing and um, taking the steps needed to to expand the real sort of democratization of policymaking so that they don't have the disproportionate amount of political power that they have now. I think that that may be a precondition to allowing um, the broader polity to make the decisions in the in their sort of in the long term societal best interest um, that need to be made. Thank you so much, Shivan. Um, thank you, panelists. It's been such a fascinating discussion, and I think that in one night or morning or afternoon, whatever time zone you are, we won't be able to discuss all of the the trade offs and what really are the solutions that we should pursue. So um, thank you very much for your time and um, I'll hand over to Orsa now to close the session. Thank you very much, May. Um, so on behalf of the three organizers of this uh, event, I would like to, of course, actually start to thank all the viewers. Uh, thank you for um, joining us today, uh, sending in questions and of course it is a bit frustrating not to be able to have more interaction, but um, thank you very much. Uh, of course, a warm thank you to Professor uh, Gupta for her uh, critical and thought provoking uh, talk. Uh, very strong delivery on getting us thinking. And um, and also, of course, a warm thanks to the excellent panelists uh, who I think um, also reminded us how we can shift the boundary of that politics of the possible uh, coming up with these concrete uh, solutions through solid, good science and analysis, through innovation and through collaboration. So with that, we wrap up this year's annual Gordon Goodman lecture and hope you will Join us again next year. Thank you all.